Yeah, well, joining me live is Jasmine Diab, Managing Director for Global Nuclear Security Partners. Jasmine, thank you so much for joining us. I guess one of the other questions is as well, is the investment uncertainty for renewables, which uh, many people uh, are talking about. But what are we looking at here in terms of figures that the coalition are putting forward? So I think what we're seeing here is the discussion about energy now and into the future and um, what is being taken into consideration but I think not being taken seriously is the significant increase in energy demand we will see across Australia uh, not so much domestically but a lot from our manufacturing and our uh, IT sector which are high energy uh, demand industries now we see these energy gaps and the modeling shows that but these are energies uh, these are industries that require energy that is stable frequency controlled and able to be provided 24 7 which is something that uh, renewable energies alone just can't do. The physics doesn't allow it to do that. So we need to introduce something into the mix to replace the coal, which is currently producing that at the moment. So it's, I think, a question of what are we actually doing to plan for these future energy demands? And is nuclear in the mix? Or are we going to be reliant on coal and gas into the future, short, medium and long term? Because otherwise we just won't be able to support those industries here in Australia, and we're likely to lose them offshore. And a very interesting report coming out today in the US with the nuclear power plant set to reopen in the US, Microsoft and Constellation Energy signing off on a deal that is going to power AI programs and cloud computing for Microsoft. This has been a topic that uh, we've been discussing for months now, the, the energy demand for AI itself is huge. Can you give us a few figures here? Yeah, so I think the US Department of Energy's figures look to about uh, a thousand megawatts uh, of power required for one AI data center, which is the equivalent of about 80,000 homes, which are significant amounts of power that is required there. The unique thing with AI data centres is that these are centres that produce a lot of heat because of the computing power. So they require 24-7 cooling uh, to allow those centres to remain operational. But those computers also are quite sensitive. So require energy that is stable, doesn't have the frequency fluctuations that you would see uh, through an instable network. And this is why in the US you're seeing companies like Microsoft and Amazon having relationships with nuclear power providers so that they can plug directly into those reactors and get that reliable power and energy for decades, right? They are signing contracts. And in this case with Microsoft, they're signing a contract with Constellation to produce power into the 2050s which is pretty phenomenal that that's, that's the plan that they're going with. So I think um, nuclear is the option that AI world is kind of linking towards. And if we want to have AI and data centres in Australia, potentially we need to start considering their energy demands as well. All right. And again, it comes to the fact of the cost and, um, and actually building the plants and, and number one, opening up those uh, the laws and having bipartisan agreement. Yeah, definitely. I think step one for Australia is lift the moratorium, allow the right people in the energy sector to find what the right balance is and where these plants need to be. Now, I know the coalition's plan has been a plan to go right where we've got current coal infrastructure because you save money on transmission lines, but the real demands for our future energy requirements may not be in those regions. So I think we need a good analysis from the energy sector that is not linked to bias towards 100% renewables. It needs to be about a balanced energy mix that uh, allows us to figure out how do we step through this plan to get us from where we are today to what our future energy requirements are and to net zero, because we want net zero, not just for the short term, we want this to endure for decades so that my daughter has clean power and energy, her children have clean power and energy and so on and so on. So um, I really think if we can lift the ban, we can start doing some detailed analysis around cost, around energy requirements and locations. So news this week where it was estimated around $665 a year per household for the coalition's plan to have seven nuclear power plants. Do you see that figure as 
reasonable? I, I think it's really difficult to do that kind of modelling off a plan that uh, doesn't have a lot of substance to it yet that we've seen. And this is why I say lift the moratorium, let us do the detailed analysis, and then you can look at what the power prices will look like. But if we want to talk about the cost of nuclear to power bills, we should look at some of our neighbouring countries. We should look at countries like France, Finland, Canada, that when they have introduced nuclear into their energy mix, even though the capital costs for those plants are high, the power bill that goes to the mum and dads at home is actually lower because the amount it costs to produce the power day-to-day -day operationally is a lot lower than in a lot of other energy forms. And so I think that some of this skewed modelling doesn't necessarily look to what realistically we would look to see in power bill prices if we did include nuclear into the energy mix. All right, Global Nuclear Security Partners Managing Director Jasmine Diab, thank you so much.